All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump into tibial plateau fractures now. You're going to see, I think, a lot of similar themes here. These are periarticular injuries of the proximal tibia, and just like tibial plafond fractures, there is a high incidence of associated soft tissue injuries. It's a, it's a fracture, excuse me, it's a soft tissue injury that's associated with the fracture. These are seen in more of a bimodal distribution than tibial plafond fractures. We see them in younger male patients, high energy trauma, or in more elderly patients with poor bone quality from a more low energy mechanism. These can be either unicondylar, meaning only one portion of the joint, that would be a B-type fracture, or bicondylar. Much more common to have a lateral tibial plateau fracture, again, usually from a more low energy mechanism. The second most common is bicondylar, and the least common is a is a medial condyle fracture. So the mechanism is typically a varus or valgus stress that's associated with an axial load. So you see the, the injury here. If you think, think of this in very basic terms, there's a tensile and a compressive side. The tension side is medial. Typically, they had a rupture of their medial collateral ligament. Compressive failures laterally with impaction of the articular surface here. These can be low energy insufficiency fractures. There is typically a soft tissue injury, especially in the zone of depression here. You want to carefully examine the meniscus in that setting. All right. So jumping right into our questions here, which of the following injuries is most likely associated with the fracture seen in figure A? All right. So as you guys can see, we're going to get into the classification in a little bit. This patient has a significantly displaced lateral tibial plateau fracture. So which of the injuries would you most likely see? Yeah, so you're going to very commonly see a lateral meniscal injury with this type of an injury pattern. So this is a Schatzker type 2, which again we will get into in a little bit. But very commonly you will see a joint depression with an associated peripheral meniscal detachment of the lateral meniscus and you'll find it within the depths of that depressed lateral plateau. Okay, so looking at our anatomy here. Okay, so I think we're all familiar with this, but we'll go through it a little bit here. Let's see, where's the pointer? There we go. Okay, so again, here's your lateral, here's your lateral plateau. Here's your, or sorry, here's your lateral plateau with lateral meniscus, the anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligament. Okay, so lateral meniscal tears that we just discussed. Those are more common than medial tears, both because of the frequency of the fracture and because of the way the, the meniscus is attached. They are associated more commonly with a Schatzker type 2 fracture pattern, which is a lateral split depression. A medial meniscal tear is commonly seen with a medial plateau fracture. Now, those are the most rare fractures that you see, so it so it's, it makes sense that these are much less common than lateral meniscal injuries. Okay, Go, going back to our questions here. We have a young, healthy male, sustains the injury seen in figure A, which is coming up. The patient has a grade 3 Lachman, varus laxity, and 15 degrees of external rotation asymmetry at 30 degrees of knee flexion. Oh my gosh, we're getting into sports world here. Okay, so for me, this is a little bit out of my uh, zone of expertise, uh, but um, basically what this is getting at, so if someone has had, what we're going to assume is an anatomic reduction of their articular surface of the tibial plateau, they still have significant instability of their Lachman and varus laxity both at zero and 30 degrees. Which of the following structures needs to be repaired uh, to restore stability of the knee? There's a lot of structures there, apparently. Okay, so you can see all the different asterisks there. Okay. All right, so it's figure C. So hopefully it goes. So they have a they have an anterior cruciate ligament injury as well as a posterior lateral corner injury. So this patient needs to have an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction as well as a posterior lateral corner reconstruction, specifically with lateral meniscal repair and allograft reconstruction of the lateral collateral ligament, which was what was the asterisk, asterisk in, figure, in, in figure C. Um, I, I can tell you that we are typically not performing those repairs and or reconstructions acutely. There are some centers that do so and will obtain a preoperative MRI to evaluate the soft tissue injury. That's something that still needs to be studied further. Okay. So, this is another great question. Ankle brachial index is most commonly indicated after sustaining which of the following fracture patterns seen in figure A through E? Okay. So, we're going to go to our answer choices here. Hopefully, you guys have had a chance to look at these images. Okay. It's figure C. So, that was the medial tibial plateau fracture. Why is that? 
Okay, so figure C was a Schatzker type 4 or a displaced medial plateau. This is considered a fracture dislocation. So when you see someone with a medial tibial plateau, even if it's minimally displaced, we think of those as multi-ligament knee injuries that are associated with the fracture. There is the highest incidence of significant vascular injury with a Schatzker type 4 fracture. And when you guys see that patient in the emergency department with that type of an injury, you have to be the patient advocate and be aware that you need to check their pulses and obtain an ankle brachial index to rule out an occult vascular injury. Okay, 22-year-old male cyclist struck by a car. He has right knee pain, reduced sensation and weakness in the right foot. His compartments are soft, pulses are palpable, x-rays are shown here. Close reduction was performed. What's the next best step in management? Okay, what do we have here? Okay, so if you guys look carefully here, right, we have a displaced medial plateau fracture. It's a fairly extensive medial plateau. It goes all the way posterior lateral here. You can see the depression. But like we just discussed, this patient needs an ankle brachial index measurement, okay? So we're concerned this patient may have an occult vascular injury. They may have a neurologic injury, but that's not a limb-threatening condition per se. So Schatzker type 4, medial tibial plateau, you must carefully examine their pulses and perform ankle brachial index. Okay, again, this is what we just discussed. If less than 0.9, further vascular testing is warranted, such as an MR or CT angiogram or even a angiogram or even angiography. Okay, associated conditions. A lot of these patients will have associated inter, uh, me, uh, intraarticular soft tissue injuries of the knee. Anterior cruciate ligament injuries are seen in up to 25% of these injuries are more common in the bicondylar fracture patterns, the type 5 and type 6. You can see compartment syndrome in these injuries. The number is variable in the literature. Again, vascular injury is most common with the Schatzker type 4 or the displaced medial tibial plateau fracture. Okay, the osteology of the lateral plateau. So the lateral plateau is convex in shape. It's typically elevated relative to the medial plateau, which has been tested. The medial plateau is concave and distal to the lateral plateau. The anterior compartment musculature arises uh, and attaches to the anterolateral tibia. The pes anserinus, the three attachments of the hamstrings, will attach to the anterior medial tibia, and that has implications for your surgical exposure as well. The medial plateau bears the majority of load of the knee, that's 60%, which is also why we're more aggressive with fixing medial plateau fractures. So this is the most commonly used classification. This is the Schatzker classification. Type 1 is a pure lateral split fracture. There's no joint depression. It's actually a pretty rare injury. And if you're being picky, you could say, well, there's probably a little bit of joint depression that you can see here, even on this injury film we tried to show. A type 2 fracture, which is the most commonly seen, is a lateral split depression. And those will commonly have a lateral meniscal disruption, especially if there's significant joint depression. A type 3 injury is a pure depression. These are more commonly seen in older patients who may have poor bone quality. It's a pure depression fracture. There's no actual fracture line that exits the lateral cortex. Type 4, which we just discussed, is a medial plateau fracture. It's a totally different animal than a lateral plateau fracture. High incidence of multiligamentous knee injury. Highest incidence of all tibial plateau fractures of vascular injury. It is a bad actor, and you need to be aware of that when you see these injuries. Bicondylar patterns, so a type 5 fracture is a fracture that does involve both condyles, but has a portion of the tibial eminence that still remains attached to the, to the tibial shaft. And then type 6 injuries here, which is, this would probably be a type 7 here. Uh, type 6 injuries have a complete metaphyseal diaphyseal dissociation. So again, that's like a type C fracture. Um, there's no portion of the articular surface that's in continuity with the tibial shaft. Okay, so the whole and more classification. Um, so this is more for proximal tibia fracture dislocations, which you can see. So you'll see these posterior coronal shearing type fractures. So a type 1 is a coronal split fracture. So you'll see injuries like this from time to time where there's essentially a posterior fracture dislocation of the knee. It doesn't really neatly fit into any of the Schatzker classifications, which is more of a coronal plane based imaging. Type 2 injuries have an entire condyle, so that can be posterior, medial, or lateral.
Type 3s are a rim avulsion. Type 4s are a rim compression. So the, you'll see these more in multi-ligamentous knee injuries where the, the person mainly has soft tissues. And type 4 is a four-part fracture analogous to a bicondylar plateau or a Schatzker 6. This is useful for true fracture dislocations and fractures that don't really fit neatly into the Schatzker classification. Okay, so these can be high energy injuries in young patients or low energy falls or injuries in the elderly patient. Physical examination, so this one's pretty obvious here. Look circumferentially to rule out an, an occult open injury. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. You, you're the one who needs to pick up the subtle injury. You need to examine for evidence of compartmental syndrome, uh, especially when the compartments are firm and, comp and not compressible. Uh, these injuries are associated with compartment syndrome. You need to test for val varus and valgus stress. For more subtle injuries or injuries where we're considering surgical treatment, this is one of the criteria. We look for laxity greater than 10 degrees with the knee fully extended. In that scenario, we are concerned about instability based on the fracture. Neurovascular examination, as we talked about, type 4, Schatzker type 4 injuries. Any differences in the pulse merits further investigation with an ankle brachial index. And again, in the Schatzker 4 injury, you want to maybe consider that right off the bat. Okay, typical views are three views of the knee, AP, lateral, and oblique. If you're in my emergency room, you actually get three oblique views. The oblique, however, is the most helpful to determine the amount of joint depression. Uh, the plateau view, you can tilt 10 degrees caudal and then actually will match the standard slope of the plateau, so that can help you to evaluate articular alignment. It's very important to evaluate for posterior medial fracture line. So there is a high incidence of posterior medial plateau involvement, especially in bicondylar fracture patterns, and these must be recognized. This is something that's been tested previously. Here we go. So this is one of the studies that looked at it. There are several studies that look at the fracture morphology and incidence of posterior lateral fragments. So this is posterior lateral. I, th what we meant to have here is actually a study looking at posterior medial. There's a great study out of Harborview, um, I believe that Dave Barre, B-A-R-E-I, was the senior author in that setting. But what they found is that there is a high incidence of posterior medial fracture involvement up to 40% or more of patients that have bicondylar patterns, and a CT scan in that setting can be very helpful to further delineate the injury. And so here we go. So in these injury patterns, I think it's very important to obtain a CT scan. You want to carefully evaluate the amount of articular depression and it can help you to, to delineate the fracture lines and plan for surgical treatment. MRI uh, is uh, controversial. Again, there are some centers that do routinely perform MRIs for plateau fractures. We know there's a high associated incidence of soft tissue injury, including meniscal pathology as well as injuries to the cruciate ligaments. There may be an evolving role for MRI. However, it's unclear at this point when we should be, uh, when we should be performing an MRI uh, for tibial plateau fractures. Okay, non-surgical treatment is typically with a hinged knee brace and either partial or non-weight bearing for a period of eight to 12 weeks. You wanna, you wanna begin immediate passive range of motion of the joint. The indications for this are minimally dis displaced fractures with a splitter depression, low energy fractures that are stable to various and valgus stress and patients that do not walk or patients that cannot tolerate surgery. Okay, so we have a 38 year old male, motor vehicle collision, he has multiple injuries, right ribs, left clavicle. Uh, he has the injury seen in figures A through D. He's nerve intact. He's in a knee immobilizer. He has moderate swelling and fracture blisters. What's the next best step in treatment? Okay, so here's our injury here. So you guys can see we have a high energy bicondylar tibial plateau fracture displacement both medially and laterally. The femur is actually subluxated and following this medial fragment here. All right, so what do we think is the best option? Yep, so there it is. So the best option is knee spanning external fixation. So analogous or similar to the tibial plafond, we do sometimes treat these injuries with spanning external fixation. Now I can tell you it's not as common as a tibial plafond, but certainly in this injury pattern, a high energy bicondylar plateau, you will give consideration to placement of a knee spanning external fixator. It'll realign his limb, and allow for his soft tissue swelling to resolve to the point where it's safe to perform internal fixation. So this is another one of the classic articles that is highly tested. It's by Egal et al. It was done out of NYU in 2005. 
Uh, and this looked at temporary bridging external fixation with delayed internal fixation for tibial plateau fractures. Now, this is not this does not mean that every tibial plateau fracture should be treated with an external fixator initially. There are certainly injury patterns that are safe to perform immediate internal fixation, and you would save that patient a second surgery. However, in high energy bicondylar patterns and high energy unicondylar patterns, this study did show that there is a benefit to placing a spanning external fixator and delaying their treatment until it's safe to perform an open exposure. Okay, so operative treatment options. External fixation with limited, open, or percutaneous reduction techniques. So this is very helpful in patients with severe soft tissue injuries, perhaps patients with minimally displaced fractures, or highly common due to fractures where internal fixation is not safe. The outcomes have been shown in one well-done study to be similar to open reduction and internal fixation. Okay, 40-year-old male fall from height. Isolated injury, shown in the images we're going to see in figures A through C. Surgery is planned. What's the most appropriate definitive fixation of his injury? Here's figures A through C. Okay, you guys can see here, we have a minimally displaced fracture. However, it involves mainly the medial tibial plateau, which we know bears 60% of the load. There is actually a small articular gap here laterally. Okay. So the most appropriate treatment for a medial tibial plateau fracture would be a medial buttress plate. Okay, so medial buttress plating is indicated. Why is it indicated? This patient has an isolated medial fracture. If you went by the AO OTA classification, this will be a B type fracture, meaning it's partial articular. There's a classic saying, B equals buttress, okay? So a partial articular fracture requires buttress fixation. That way we can achieve an anatomic reduction and stable fixation. Um, okay, so this talks about in more detail medial plateau fractures. Again, the images we just saw are not necessarily analogous with that situation, but in highly displaced Schatzker 4 injuries, what we think of is that these are basically the medial plateau fragment is the stable fragment and everything else is unstable. Um, and that, that goes into the kind of high energy nature of these injuries and the fact that they have multi-ligamentous injuries associated with them. Okay, so operative treatment with open reduction and internal fixation. Indications, this can be a bit of a moving target. Um, the articular step off, accepted articular step off, you will heal corroded up to one centimeter of articular step off is acceptable for non-operative treatment that remains controversial. Condylar widening, varus valgus instability, medial plateau fractures, and malalignment of the anatomic axis, are, or mechanical axis, excuse me, are all indications for surgical treatment. Especially the condylar widening, I think, is a very helpful thing to look at. Again, the articular step off can be a bit of a moving target. Three millimeters is what we're quoting here. Medial plateau fractures, by and large, are going to be treated surgically because we know it is a more significant load-bearing load, uh, portion of the articular surface. When treating these with open reduction and internal fixation, restoring joint stability is absolutely critical. There's worse results seen with ligamentous instability or alteration of the mechanical axis greater than 5 degrees. Temporary external fixation typically is performed with two half pins inserted into the femur and the tibia. Again, with the pins in the tibia, you want to be careful to place those, if at all possible, outside the zone of planned plate fixation. You want to place the knee in slight flexion. Um, this has been shown to decrease the rate of infection and wound healing complications for certain injury patterns. Unlike the, plateau, unlike the tibial plafond, not all injuries, only for certain high energy injury patterns. External fixation with limited internal fixation. You must keep the wires greater than 14 millimeters away from the joint. The capsular reflection medially is 14 millimeters from the joint. You can apply hybrid fixation. Post-operatively, uh, this frame will usually remain in, remain in place for two to four months. You begin weight bearing when you see visible callus. External fixation minimizes the soft tissue injury. So just like the tibial plafond or any other location, this can limit the risk of an open exposure. However, the cons are pin site complications mainly. Okay, so we have a 44-year-old female. She has the injury shown in figures A and B as a result of a motor vehicle collision. She's had a four-compartment fasciotomy and placement of an external fixator. Post-fixation CT is shown in figure C. Optimal definitive treatment is which of the following? 
Okay. So we have a high energy bicondylar tibial plateau fracture. There's no attachment of the articular surface to the to the tibial shaft. All right. So we have an X fix in place. What's the best treatment? Okay. So this is uh, someone who has uh, a chance of having a very poor outcome. However, the best possible treatment is open reduction and internal fixation with medial and lateral plates. So a bi combinated bicondylar fracture. Typically, initially, we're going to manage that with an external fixator, especially when they've had a fasciotomy uh, and they have an associated compartment syndrome. Um, we do tend to restore these with both medial and lateral plates. A lot of these injuries have an associated posterior medial fracture fragment and this contains a lot of the medial plateau articular surface. We, you want to carefully scrutinize that on your preoperative CT scan, which is typically obtained after the external fixator is placed. And then you want to attempt to stabilize this with a medial or posterior medial plate. Commonly, this fragment can be missed or poorly stabilized from a single lateral plate. Okay, 53-year-old patient, open reduction in internal fixation, the uh, injury shown in figures A through C. Okay, for operative report states fracture stabilized with the anterolateral and posterior medial non-locked plates. Figure D, lateral x-ray at two weeks following surgery. What technical approach would have prevented this complication? Okay, so I hope you guys can see here that this patient has a substantial amount of posterior lateral articular depression. Okay, and that's what they're trying to show with these images. And then they have a significantly increased sagittal slope of the tibia here. Um, all right, so let's see what we have for our answer choices. Supplementary fixation of the posterior lateral fragment. So that's, again, I think a controversial topic. Um, I can tell you that exposure and fixation of the posterior lateral articular surface, especially direct exposure of the posterior lateral tibial plateau, is significantly challenging. Um, so that is something that's coming into, I wouldn't even say vogue, but it's something that's being talked about more and more. Um, I don't know if we're going to be fixing all the posterior lateral joint injuries. It's the most common location to see malreduction. That's a study by Buckley uh, that showed that the most common location for articular malreduction for the plateau is posterior lateral. So perhaps this is something you're going to be seeing more and more on your tests. Uh, however, again, I think it's still controversial at this point. So open reduction and internal fixation. Lateral incision is the most commonly performed. You can perform a straight, a slightly curved, or what's known as a hockey stick incision, which is basically transverse of the joint and then continuing in line with the anterior compartment. Um, a midline incision is discouraged. Uh, and you, first of all, of course, if you're treating this operatively, you want to achieve, if all possible, an anatomic reduction. But also, historically, these were treated with a midline incision with high associated rates of soft tissue complications because of poor soft tissue technique, periosteal stripping. So that would significantly hinder that patient's future total knee arthroplasty if you had a severe soft tissue complication from a midline exposure. So here we go. So the posterior medial incision, typically between the pes anserinus and the medial head of the gastroc, there's your green box, okay? Dual surgical incisions with dual plate fixation. So what you're looking for, bicondylar injury, pla injury patterns with any displacement of that medial tibial plateau, you want to certainly scrutinize for posterior medial articular involvement, and you want to plan on dual plate fixation with two incisions, typically anterolateral and posterior medial, or sometimes anterolateral and direct medial. All right, so this is the study by Beret that I was discussing earlier, and I misquoted this, so I'll take a step back from that. 74% of the bicondylar injuries had a posterior medial fragment, and that typically does require alternative or supplementary fixation, typically with a posterior medial buttress plate. Okay, the goals of the articular reduction, just like any other periarticular injury, are to anatomically restore the joint surface. There is commonly a metaphyseal void this can be filled with autogenous or, auto, I mean, or, or allograft or bone graft substitutes. You can see this is a question that's been tested before. Calcium phosphate cement has a high compressive strength for filling the metaphyseal void. It's had three prior questions uh, on it. Okay, absolute stability for the articular surface. So a lot of these injuries can be treated with a buttress type plate, especially the unicondylar injury patterns. Uh, or the partial articular injuries. We should attempt to achieve absolute stability. Again, this is commonly performed with either lag screws, 
and a neutralization plate or with buttress plating techniques or some combination of the two. Uh, plates for partial articular fractures. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. For partial articular injury, and especially in a younger patient with good bone quality, there's no reason to place locking screw fixation in that patient. All right, so non-locked buttress plating is best indicated for a simple partial articular fractures in patients with good bone quality. Locked plates, they form a fixed angle construct. There is, there is or can be less compression of the periosteum and soft tissue. Now also the majority of our fractures that we're seeing or the majority of our fixation construct that we're using are a hybrid of of locked and non-locked screws. So you don't necessarily get that effect of not compressing the periosteum. Okay, post-operatively, you can place the patient in a hinged knee brace with early passive range of motion. You can also perform active range of motion. The use of bracing in these injuries, just like in anterior cruciate ligament injuries, is somewhat controversial. We're not sure if the patient actually needs to have the brace. There is, a, there are, there are associated uh, collateral ligament injuries sometimes, and you can consider a brace. However, that's something that's controversial, and the patient is typically non-weight bearing for eight to twelve weeks following surgery. Post-traumatic arthritis. Rate increases with metastectomy, axial malalignment, intraarticular infection, and right, joint uh... instability. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.